my little picture that I drew there is the theme for First Peter. First Peter is a marvelous book. Many people just absolutely adore the promises, the challenges, the invitations that are in this book. But it really deals with managing the stress monster. And I put stress with an asterisk. The word stress can really be any kind of experience or issue that causes distress in your life. It can be fear. That can be a fear monster. It can be fear over money or fear over situations or fear for your family or fear over COVID or fear over being vaccinated or not being vaccinated or whatever those situations are. It can be anxiety where there's just a nervousness. You're not quite sure what to do with it. You toss and turn at night and there's things you can't settle in your mind. It can be an anxiety monster. It can be an anger monster. That there's things that have happened way back, years and years and years ago, that you just haven't been able to get over yet. And I know forgive and forget, blah, blah, blah. And you're not able to do that. It's just not coming easily. The, the uh, stress monster can be exhaustion. There's so many demands on your life. You can't say no to everything. Some things are essential and they're just not an option. And yet it's wearing you out. It can be confusion. You just don't know what the right way to go is. What the next step ought to be. It can be from a situation we talked about for Melanie, where all of a sudden there's this massive health issue that comes up. You didn't ask for it. You weren't expecting it. You didn't know it was going to happen. Yet it's plopped on your life and you have to deal with it, but it's just exhausting you. It can be a confusion monster where there's too many options and they're all good or they're all bad or the mix of good and bad. You just, you just can't figure it out. Or a loneliness monster. It can be any other kind of issue that goes into the course of your life. Peter wrote a letter for you. That's what really 1 Peter is about. It is a letter that was written to people who are just like us. You kind of get the idea that Bible people are either all totally evil, wicked, miserable, horrible people, or they're like all porcelain and covered with gold, and they have halos on their head. And one of the worst things ever to happen is medieval art created this idea that Bible characters were these wonderful, lovely, gilded folks that had halos like frisbees around their heads, and they floated along through life, and, and they always are dressed perfectly, and their feet never really get dirty. And I mean, that you kind of have the idea from medieval art that that's what the Bible is about. It's not. 2,000 years ago, technology was different. It's amazing how much they had that is really matching what we can do today. They couldn't fly in airplanes, but they could build pyramids with no seams and hidden rooms inside with stones that weighed tons that you can put your hand on and they move on their own. I mean, how did they figure that stuff out? I know aliens came about it. But the people themselves, what happens after death? How do you preserve this life? How do you give things to the next generation who are squirrely little kids that don't deserve what we did for them? People wrote about that stuff for the last 2,500, 3,000 years. Whenever we have records that are permanent enough to have survived, we find out that the things that worried people are the same things that worry us now. And the things that delighted people are the same things that delight us now. That's one of the reasons why the gospel is eternal. Because though it, it was brought into reality 2,000 years ago, people are still basically the same. And what we struggle with, what we're delighted by, the 
the knowledge we have only so many years, and even that's not guaranteed. It can be taken in a split second. So Peter writes to folks just like us. In fact, under God's inspiration, he actually wrote to us. And so as we read this letter and study it and think about the principles, the ideas, the applications, he's not writing about things that just happened long, long ago, and Bible times are dusty, uh, old events that have nothing to do with what life is like today. Peter writes his first letter, and we're going to look a little bit more carefully. He writes to whom he calls the elect. And the elect are people scattered throughout the provinces. That's what this first letter is about. Paul's letters often are written to one church in a location dealing with very specific issues. But Peter writes to everyone. He writes to all of us. What's so fascinating about all this is the letter applies principles and specifics of how to manage the stress monster. We're going to see that come up throughout his entire letter. He has some, we're not going to go verse by verse and study absolutely every single word, but we're going to look at principled concepts and applications of those concepts to what do you do on a Tuesday or next week or even later today. It's stuff you can apply in your life. Today's passage we're looking at is 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 through 9. Here's what Peter writes. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in various trials. These have come so that the Proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the end result of your faith. That is, the salvation of your souls. Peter starts off this letter with some of the most majestic concepts in the New Testament. It is fascinating what he writes here. He starts out by saying, You are chosen. He calls the church the elect. Now, in Christian theology, 
there is one side of the church that says God has chosen certain individuals and rejected others. There's some verses that you can go through the Old Testament, New Testament anecdotes, and you can find situations in which there were those who were brought into God's relationship and those that were rejected from God's relationship. But the concept of the elect, which was originally a word Israel had taken only for itself, it was a divisive term. It was those who were in covenant with God said, you're not. We are. And there's a gulf that separates the elect from the non-elect. And you can't get in without incredibly difficult and rigorous changes in your life. But Peter is writing to virtually all Gentiles, not Jews. He's not writing to Israel. He's writing to the church. He's writing to those who have simply become followers of Jesus Christ. When he calls himself an apostle of Jesus, that means he was sent out by him. He's got a commission. Jesus is the message giver, and an apostle is the message carrier. He doesn't originate the message. He's not responsible for the message. It is not in his purview to be able to control the message or adapt it. An apostle is someone like an ambassador. He's not permitted to create the content. He carries the content for the one who gives it, Jesus Christ. When he addresses the church, he says, you have been chosen. But the question is, chosen for what? My absolute favorite musical of all time is Fiddler on the Roof. I love that movie. I lo- from the first time I saw it, I just fell in love with the storyline. My family are Ashkenazi Jews, and the story of Tevya and Golda being driven from their community and struggling with the changes that were happening in the world they couldn't control, they couldn't predict, and they couldn't deal with. And in one song, Tevya talks about being chosen by God. And then he identifies how much trouble have come to those who are calling themselves Jews in that world. And he says to God, couldn't you choose someone else? Peter is is identifying that contemporary idea in an ancient letter to those who weren't Israel but are called chosen. Chosen for what? Chosen for difficulty? Chosen for glory? Chosen for trouble? Chosen to have the foot of God stomp on them? The hand of God hold them up? What were they chosen for? When Peter writes this letter, the words that he uses become incredibly valuable. He says... To God's elect. Here's the letter that I'm writing. You are the elect of God. You are his chosen. You're electoi. Called out from among those in the world for special purpose. And then he says, in New International, it's translated exiles. That word in the original language is a very, very unusual word. It's parapidemoi. And parapidemoi means refugees. It was a word used very negatively for those who were forced from their own homes and are now wanderers, sojourners. They don't belong there. They don't have a place there. They're yearning to go back home. And they're only here for a short time under duress. And he calls the church, you are exiles and you are refugees. In today's world, 
all of us know the challenges that the United States is having with the southern border and the border from Haiti, people crossing over the sea or coming by land. But this is not unique to the United States. Russia is struggling with the exact same issue. So is France. So is England. So is Italy. So is Kenya. It's not that people are leaving Kenya for a better life. They're leaving Somalia and Ethiopia and crossing the border, but they're bringing disease, they're bringing weapons, they're bringing challenges, they're sneaking in. The very same issues that are being raised here are being raised around the world. Even those countries with rigid fixed borders guarded carefully by military have a struggle with refugees and migrants, people struggling to find some kind of safety or food or sustenance or, or acceptance, but they know they don't belong there. And they're only going to sojourn for a while. Paul is, or Peter is using this concept as a major theme. We're citizens of heaven. We belong to God. There is a kingdom into which we have been called and invited and ushered in through the blood of Christ. And here in this world, we are refugees here. It's a very negative word in the Greek language that Peter starts out as his second description. You're elect. You're chosen. You're on top of the world. You are refugees. You're at the bottom of the world. You're under the feet of everybody. You are scum and you are children of the king. He's writing to people so it's not rushed through the first few words of this letter. It is we're really both at the same time. We're at the very, very top and we're at the very, very bottom. Or he's maybe talking about different groups of people. No, he's talking to the church. You are elect and you are refugees. He says you are scattered throughout the regions of the world. The list of these six or seven places are largely in Turkey, Galatia, Cappadocia, Bithynia. That's kind of in that Central Asian area, which is where the church first became scattered. But it was also where the Jews were scattered during the persecutions at the end of the time of the kings and when they went into exile. The diaspora is the word that he uses here. So he's mixing images between what happened to Israel and what has happened to the church, which is the same struggle. They've been scattered, and you don't really belong there, but you can't go home either. It's a very interesting beginning to this letter. All these qualities, these three qualities of being chosen, being refugees, and being scattered... Those three qualities came according to the foreknowledge of God. He knew this was going to happen. It raises the question, how can a loving God do this to people? I mean, why did he make it so rough? Why didn't he just give us a nice kingdom with big, big walls and meals for everybody and all our diseases taken care of? Why didn't he just fix the world, invite us in, and then we're done? We're done. Because according to his foreknowledge and the sanctifying work of his spirit, it is to have us learn obedience to Jesus Christ. It used to be 15, 10, 15, 20 years ago, there were little bracelets that had WWJD. What would Jesus do? And he always, the idea is always step up, lift up, high up. When Paul writes 2 Corinthians, he says, here's God's will for your life. You want to know what God's will is? is to, to move here or marry this person or have a certain job or buy a certain car. That's not the will of God. Make decisions on those things. That's good. But the will of God is for you to become like Jesus. He wants to create in you the image of his son, to be able to have his son replicated in you. And, and how is Jesus to be replicated? He struggled. He was opposed 
He had loyalty from his friends, but even his friends balked. That was a huge struggle. People acclimated to him, and then they left him. He was wounded. He was hurt. Eventually, he died. He was mortal. But he's the firstborn from the dead. So to replicate, to recreate the image of Christ in us is not that we walk on water, turn water into wine so we don't have to stop the liquor store. It's so that we become like him. In our strength, we humble ourselves. In our glory, we understand what it means to be a migrant. When we have ownership of the things that matter the most in life, we don't grip those things, but we multiply them into the lives of others. The journey is really challenging, and Peter recognizes that. But in this letter, he will admit that reality in a very interesting way. We're going to see this as we go through the chapters of 1 Peter. In verse 6, New International phrases the original language this way. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, you may have to suffer various kinds of trials. The New International kind of softens that, but the Greek is really soft as well. Peter is recognizing in the world you are walking as migrants, there are really some very, very hard things happening for Christians in that day. In 64 AD, Nero was emperor he had syphilis, and he started to lose his mind, and so there were some crazy things that happened. But in 64, in July of 64, there was a massive fire that broke out in Rome. Huge fire. It was mostly wooden buildings, and they were built in a very slipshod way. The historians at the time said Nero was on a building frenzy to expand Rome as quickly as he could so he would be the emperor of one of the largest cities in the world. They weren't at war, so he brought all the armies back and turned them into builders so they could build as fast as possible. The streets were very narrow. Things were built out of wood and, and other kind of combustible materials. The, the public buildings were all built out of stone, but the normal neighborhoods were built out of virtual cardboard. And there was a fire that some think Nero actually authorized to start. And then he disabled the fire crews from getting enough water to put it out so he could burn his own city down and then craft the city in his own likeness later. I mean, that kind of crazy stuff. So as people began to accuse Nero of burning his own city down, he said... It was the Christians. Christians were the ones. Jews were legal religion, but Christianity was not at the time. And he didn't want to accuse the mythological priests and all that kind of stuff. So he knew something about the Christian world, and he said, it's the Christians that did this. You know, they eat people, and they drink blood. They won't let anybody stay in their service when they're eating a body and drinking blood, but these people are just evil. And the Roman world believed that. So they started going against Christians. And it happened for a very certain time in a certain kind of place. But Peter recognized that's the world you guys live in. That's what you're facing. That's where the trouble is right now. And then in verse 6, he says, I know you're going to have to go through some trials, maybe for a little bit. But here's one of the things that Peter does in managing the stress monster. He sandwiches verse 6 between verses 3 to 5 and 7 to 9. Peter's perspective is you squeeze the stress monster, which is real, with things that are greater truths. Here's the list, and we're going to see this come up again in the letter. Here's what he says. 
Blessed be God. Bless God. According to his great mercy, we have been birthed from above. We have a human life, but we have a new birth as well. We have been birthed into a vivacious, living faith. A hope that is built on resurrection beyond death. We have an inheritance that is unperishing, unspoiling, and unfading. The three words there, actually in Greek, all rhyme similarly. That's what our inheritance is. It is unperishing, unspoiling, meaning doesn't rot. It is unfading. By faith, it is shielded by God's power until our salvation comes. Oh yeah, verse 6. You're going to go through some trials and difficulties in this life. Verse 7, it will prove and refine your faith like gold that results in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. Not seeing him, you love him. You've been filled with a joy that goes beyond expression. You receive the outcome of your faith, which is the salvation of your souls. So there is this monster. It's a stressful monster. It's a monster of fear, of anger, of resentment, of difficulty, of confusion, of loneliness, of isolation. But he puts that bitter meat between glory and honor. The things that really do matter and the promises that you have that establish your life into glory and honor and praise. Now, Peter's going to take this theme and he's going to work it all the way through the book. So when the monster's coming after you, sandwich the monster. Get a grip on him and say, you know, I'm anxious about this, but I have this confidence. I have this assurance. I know this is true. I don't know about you, the future, the conflict, what my next job is going to be, who dislikes me. I don't know that. That bothers me, but I'm going to sandwich that between what I know to be true. Peter's going to write to us about a living hope that does not perish, it will not spoil, and it does not fade. Let's pray together. Father, you wrote this letter through Peter to a bunch of folks a long time ago. But you also wrote it to us. You've called us elect. But you also call us refugees. Two words back to back. We're sojourners, and we want you to walk with us. Not just call us from a distant place. Walk with us, we pray in Jesus' name.